This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. Our topic today is really serious. It's a big deal. It affects an enormous number of people, about 800,000 Americans each year. We're talking about stroke. We're talking about your brain. And every 45 seconds, one of us has a stroke right here in the United States. To get us through this topic, we have with us a true expert, Dr. Alexander Kalesi. Welcome. Thank you, David. Dr. Klesi is, I'm gonna read this because I wanna get it right, Director of Endovascular Neurosurgery at UCSD and Surgeon Director of the uh, Neurocritical Care Unit. Correct. I got it right, okay. Perfect. Um, and um, uh, you know, you're here where we have a comprehensive stroke center at UCSD, which I think all of us at the university are really proud of. So Thank you. we're glad that you're here. Um, I, I think I set the stage up, uh, 140,000 people a year die. Um, we've got uh, uh, somewhere just under a million people a year affected. This is, this is kind of a big deal, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity and you bringing attention to this important matter. I mean, the reality is, is that it's the third leading killer and the leading cause of disability in the United States. And, and I think it, it's helpful uh, for the audience to first define our terms. So a, a stroke. Well, and that's exactly where we want to yeah. go is, is um, these are words I think people throw around and yeah. they say, oh, did you hear so-and-so had a stroke? but I'm not sure anybody has a, a real clue of what that means. Yeah, you're, you're precisely right. I mean, a stroke is essentially when part of your brain dies, and, and there's two major ways that, that happens. In the same way that when you have a heart attack, when there's a lack of blood flow to one of the organs of your body, that, that organ can die. And so when you, if you have a blockage of one of the arteries in the brain, that can cause a stroke, and that's about 85% of the strokes that, that we're talking about. Another 15% of strokes are a special type of stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke. So as opposed to a part of the brain dying because of a lack of blood flow, you have a bleed into the substance of the brain, and that's where it's so important to have a team of people who, who can manage it through that. Sounds like a brain attack. Yeah. You talk about heart attacks, exactly a brain right. attack. That's exactly what a stroke um, is. And so something damages the ability of the brain to function. Yep. Either the blood doesn't get there for one of two reasons, you bleed or it gets blocked. Right, exactly uh, right. And, and, and so there's a, an immediate cost to the person. And then there's a cost to society. We, the numbers I saw were somewhere near $40 billion a yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's real. Yeah. This it, is a it, big deal. Yeah, in terms of direct medical costs, it, the, the number has been as high as $65 billion a year, and then that's not even counting the indirect costs. That is all the lost economic productivity that, that goes into someone who's, who's permanently disabled. And, and that deficit is, is really a function of the part of the brain that's died, because in the brain, it, as you know, location is everything. And so if we're dealing with the dominant hemisphere of the brain, the seat of language and consciousness, um, th those people can be paralyzed on one side of their body and, and unable to talk and communicate with their loved ones. So this is no question a devastating disease. The yeah, I'm, I'm an ophthalmologist, and people always say to me, oh my God, that's the eye, it's such a big deal. And I don't think of it that way, but when I think of the brain, uh, every time I remember in medical school and whenever we get close to it as yeah. ophthalmologists, I think the person's in there. I mean, right. that, that's what the person is. Yeah. And this can literally change who the person is. No question. And, and I think one of the things that's so exciting for me as a neurosurgeon who does open surgery in the brain and also uses catheters uh, to treat these kind of problems is there used to be a real nihilism about stroke, that this was something that there wasn't anything we could do to stop a stroke from happening. And once it happened, a lot of our goals of care were really to just support someone through that new deficit or that new disability. And, and now I think we're entering an era where there's a lot more that, that we can do in a disease-centered way. And, and as you mentioned, one of the things that's exciting here at, here at UCSD is that comprehensive stroke center designation that's been taken on on a national level is really a recognition that, that where you go for care matters and there's things we can offer patients that weren't available even 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw a quote, I think it was of yours, that said, the comprehensive centers have better outcomes. 
Yeah, that's true. In fact, you know, as you know, the Joint Commission essentially certifies care in a whole host of different diseases, but something that was really exciting in, in this larger policy environment where we're talking about the Affordable Care Act and other things is people are really starting to look at quality metrics, and this is one of the first time that a certification process didn't just look at processes of care. That is, someone sees a doctor in X amount of time, gets these procedural tests. It's that your complication rates and your outcomes were actually better. So when we, we start to go into the different procedures, procedures we offer for patients who are having a stroke, you need to be able to offer that procedure in, in a technically safe way in, in order to achieve this designation. And, and I want to dive into that, but in a moment. Sure. Because there's a couple of more things I want to define with you. Yeah, no problem. We defined a stroke. We defined blockage and bleeding. How does blood get to the brain and what conduit does it flow through to get there? Yeah, terrific question. So, so there, are more, there are four major arteries that originate in the major artery of your, of your body. Your aorta takes blood away from the heart. There's four arteries that essentially come off that or a branch of the aorta. The two carotid arteries in the front and the two vertebral arteries in the back. And the carotids are the ones when, you know, on TV you see people go exactly like this. Exactly right. Yeah, you, you, you feel the pulse in the neck. Th those, those are the pipes that are responsible for providing blood flow to our hemispheres, the two large large uh, halves of our brain. In the back, the vertebral arteries join and form a, a large artery in the middle of the brain called the basilar artery, and that's largely responsible for getting blood to the connection between our brain and our body, to the brain stem, which is essentially the origin of the spinal cord. So all three of those arteries, the two carotids in the front and, and the basilar artery in the brain are, are essential to us, you know, walking around, breathing, living, talking every day. Well, so here's our pipe. <laughs> right, it yeah. goes right up to the brain right, right here. And so uh, as part of the treatment, prevention, looking for what to do, you're going to start from the neck up. Exactly right. Exactly. Actually, even a little bit lower down, all the, all the way to the heart. Because when we think about how someone has a blockage of one of the arteries of the brain, there's basically two major mechanisms that, that, that go on. One is a blockage of one of those major pipes, like we talked about. The other is if you have a, a plaque or a narrowing of one of those arteries and a little piece breaks up and goes and blocks a smaller artery in the brain. And so there are basically three major causes uh, of stroke. One is a, a blockage of the artery in the neck or in the artery of the brain. That's responsible together for about a third of strokes. Uh, another 20% are caused when our heart, as it beats, doesn't beat in a rhythmic way. If there's an arrhythmia of the heart, the blood flow in the heart becomes turbulent and that blood can clot and then go up and embolize to the brain. And then lastly, about 5% of people or a subset of patients who have cancer, their blood clots when it's not supposed to. So the pipes look fine, the heart's working fine, but that blood clots when it's not supposed to, and that can lead a stroke to happen The further as well. downstream the, or upstream, however you look at it, the, the closer to the heart that this blockage occurs, the more the part of the brain that gets destroyed or Potentially, gets devastated. Potentially, yeah. What, what ends up becoming more important in terms of what part of the brain is ultimately affected is how large that blockage is. In other words, how large the artery in the brain is that's been blocked. And so when we talk about a large vessel stroke, we're talking about there's six major arteries in the brain, the, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries on both sides. And so if one of those arteries is blocked, you're talking about a very large territory stroke. And we know that those strokes actually cause enormous disability and are much more likely to cause you to pass away. And so one of the targets that we've looked at in terms of treatment of stroke is now using very small catheters to try to open up arteries when someone's actually having a stroke of one of those large vessels. I'm almost picturing uh, an accident on the freeway and everything gets shut down and there's yeah. no flow versus an accident in a side street and how many people get affected and where it's affected, et cetera. Yeah, that's precisely the right way to think about it. And, and, that's, and that also guides our treatment. If you're talking about a, a blockage of a major artery, that's something that represents a good surgical or catheter-based target because you're working, you're working in large blood vessels and we have devices that are small enough to get there. If you're talking about a tiny artery, you know, that's less of the brain that's ultimately at risk and we have blood thinning medicines we can give in that situation because it's hard for us to get there surgically. So we've scared people. We've made them nervous about what we're talking yeah. about. Um, I, I want to hit how somebody knows they might be having a stroke, who's at risk, what we can do to prevent it, and then I want to dive into some of the really cool stuff that you're doing about Great. treatment. So how does someone know they're having a stroke? Yeah, so it, 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 one of the most important things is, is the recognition of an acute neurologic deficit. So if you have an asymmetry of your face, so one side of your face goes weak, you have weakness or numbness of either your arm or leg, and if you have disruption of speech. Those things are, are things that 
this is the one medical condition where if you are thinking there's even a remote possibility you're having a stroke, you need to seek medical attention right away because you're losing 1.9 million neurons every minute that you wait. And so, and there, there are options that, that go off the table if you're out of certain time windows from when your symptoms start to when you actually seek medical care. So heading to the emergency room, calling 911 is the most important first step. Now, now most of these things occur in people over 65, some two thirds to three quarters. It's important and hopefully we'll have time to talk about what happens to the younger crowd yeah. when that happens. But a lot of that, that, that group has aches and pains and things aren't quite right and they kind of just, you know, they, they want to blow it off sometimes. Sure. Did, is it the person who's having the stroke that knows it, or is it somebody who's with them that notices it? How do most of these get found? Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific question. So for, for minor strokes, often people have insight into the fact that they're developing a, a new problem. But you're right, more than any other disease, it's a, a third party observer who's gonna recognize this person's not quite right. And actually, one of the real challenges in stroke care is usually the person who's having the problem thinks they're fine. And so they really resist seeking care and, and, and wanting to actually get in that ambulance and, and go to the emergency room. And so you can be a real advocate uh, for your loved one or your friend if you realize something's not right and, and you actually force them to actually seek medical care in that situation. I had it happen once. My mother-in-law, the side of her face was starting to go yeah. down and I'm like, we have yeah, to go to the emergency yeah. room. And she fought me. Yeah. I, I'm fine. No what are you question. talking about? You know? Yeah, you're, exa you're exactly right. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough that it is the best everyday opportunity to really save someone's life because they're often largely in a position where they can't help themselves. The brain's the part of the body that tells you moment to moment that you're okay. And so when that's the organ affected, you're in a situation where you're really relying on the people around you to recognize that and, and, and get you to appropriate medical Even attention. if it's not a full stroke, are there warning strokes? Are there red flags that God yeah. is sort of sending no, you saying yeah. pay attention? It, 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 what you're describing is something called a transient ischemic attack or a TIA. And that's a, a temporary interruption of blood flow to the brain, but that, that occlusion or that blockage is restored before that part of the brain actually dies. We do have a window of time before that brain dies where we can actually you know, get that handled. That tends to happen with certain types of, of causes of stroke more than others. And so if you're dealing with a structural vascular problem, a, a blockage of the carotid artery like we talked about earlier, that's classically associated with a TIA. That can also cause a, a window shade to come down in your vision from a lack of blood flow to the eye. So those kind of warning signs definitely put you at higher risk for, for a larger or, or more permanent stroke. So if it, it kind of comes and goes, don't ignore it. No question, you need to seek <laughs> medical care right away. It, because because that, that's essentially, you're being given a rare window of opportunity to fix that problem before that major stroke sets hey, in. Somebody's calling. Yeah, yeah, the yeah phone. exactly, okay. exactly. So who's at risk? Who are the people at risk? We talked about over 65. Who else is at risk for this to happen? Well, so uh, I, I would say that uh, not just over 65, once you, once you get above 50, you really are at higher risk of, of developing carotid disease. As I mentioned, people with a history of cancer or any type of bleeding disorder are at increased risk. People who've had heart disease in the past are increased risk of that abnormal rhythm of your heart. Um, there are other lifestyle factors that dramatically increase your risk. If you're a smoker, for example, um, this is one of those disease states that you know a lot of people have focused on smoking and lung cancer, but there's really nothing worse for your blood vessels than, than prolonged exposure. There's not one physician I've ever had on the show that said, oh, and smoking is good for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just every disease, yeah. smoking comes up as no a No question, thing. no question. And then other diseases that put you at increased risk of stroke, diabetes is, is, is really the leading cause. And obviously, if you have high cholesterol or you're, you're dramatically overweight, all of those things do tend to increase your risk of stroke. Um, what about stuff people do to themselves? Alcoholism, drug use. Yeah, well, well, alcoholism can hurt you insofar as it starts to affect your liver. Uh, there's no question that that actually can, can cause an increased risk of blockages of the arteries of the brain. Drug use, like for example, IV drug use or, or meth or cocaine, those drugs that actually dramatically increase your blood pressure put you at a much higher risk of that second type of stroke of having a bleed into your brain as, as opposed to a blockage of one of the arteries of the brain, which is obviously no less serious. Um, the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, no question. What, what what do you do to, there's some genetic things that you're stuck with and there's some environmental things that have happened to you, but most of them are modifiable, at least yeah. to some extent. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you tell people to do to help keep this on their own side rather well, than the wrong side? Yeah, no, no, understood. Well, I, I think I, the most important things I counsel people on is just trying to make sure that they actually 
take good care of themselves. They, they get regular exercise, they have a, a good low sodium, low fat diet, all of those things diminish your risk of stroke. Um, as important as if you have any of those symptoms that, that we've described earlier, that you actually seek appropriate attention and, and that you get screened. Once you get over 50 years of age, you want to start thinking about getting screened, for example, with, with an ultrasound of your carotid arteries to make sure you're not developing one of those blockages and, and, and making sure that, you, that your heart health is that in everybody care. or in people with a high risk factor? Usually people who actually, definitely if you have a, a little bit of a higher risk factor, so if you have a history of diabetes or high cholesterol, um, no question those people should be screened at 50. Um, there, there's not a lot of class one evidence to support everyone getting screened, um, but if you've ever had uh, one of these symptoms that we've described, there's no, no question you wanna take a look, because as I mentioned, that, that's responsible for almost a third of strokes overall. So let's take a hypothetical person who for whatever reason ends up having a stroke, they're at lunch with a friend of theirs. They call 911 sure. right away. They get picked up by an ambulance. They get taken where? Well, uh, it, it, it depends on, on, on the community you live in. We're, we're not at a place yet from a health systems infrastructure standpoint that, that care is triaged. Uh, based on, on the level of service available. In most counties, and San Diego's been out in front on, on some of these issues, you would get taken to a primary stroke center. So that's a stroke center that at least has the ability to give you a blood thinning medicine called TPA. Um, in situations where someone's presenting with a severe stroke, we're actually here at the university working with the AHA as part of a regional task force. The American to, Heart Association. Yeah, exactly, thank you. It, to make sure that, that those folks would potentially go to a comprehensive center where they would have the kind of the full complement of service. Um, so I call 911. Is there anything I do before the paramedics get there? Uh, no, yeah, it usually. Do I reach no. for aspirin? Do yeah, I do no, anything? No, I'm really glad that you raised that issue because, as I mentioned, 85% uh, of the time we're dealing with a blockage of one of the arteries of the brain, but 15% of the time we're dealing with a bleed within the brain itself. So that's the last situation in which you'd want to thin someone's blood by giving them aspirin. So this is very different than a heart attack where you're often taught. To, 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 to chew an aspirin because you're not in a, there's a real downside to thinning someone's blood if we're dealing with a, with a hemorrhage. So we're, we're careful about this. We get you to the experts. We get this person to the experts. Right. They go to the ER. The ER determines it's hemorrhagic or it's not hemorrhagic. Right, with a CT scan. Yep. And, and, then, and this is all happening ASAP because right. there is a clock ticking. Away. No question. Yeah, so when someone hits the door with an acute neurologic deficit, we're suspecting a stroke, they go right to the CT scan at most certified They're not stroke sitting centers. filling in the paperwork. No, <laughs> this is, the, you get fast tracked. There's, okay. there's, no, there's, no, there's no waiting room in, in, in this situation. And, and, that, and, that, and you get right to the CT scanner, once there's not a bleed, if they're coming in within three and in many institutions within four and a half hours of their symptoms, they actually get a, a blood thinning medicine called IV TPA. Right. They'll then get a picture of their arteries and if, they're, if we're dealing with a blockage of one of the arteries in the neck or a blockage of one of the major arteries in the brain and their symptoms don't improve with the TPA, that's when a, an interventionalist like myself would come in and potentially use catheters and, and some devices we have available to, to relieve that blockage. Well, this has changed so much since I was in medical school. I, I, I've been, I can't wait to talk this next part with yeah. you. Okay, so now you finally show up and, and there are these two types, the, the blockage and the hemorrhagic right. kinds, um, and the person's not getting better and they call you. Yep. So you now have a toolbox. You're at a, you know, at UCSD, we're at a comprehensive stroke center. So right. you have a toolbox of every possible thing, some stuff you break out once in a while, some stuff you use all the time. Right. What are the kinds of new tools that people should be aware of that sort of game changers yeah. that you're able to bring to the well, table? Yeah, no, no question. And, and, and part of the reason it, that this designation came about is the technology has really evolved. We have two major technologies now that we use to, to, to open arteries in the brain. One is an aspiration or a suction system that's called the penumbra system. And we have been able over time, over different engineering iterations, been able to safely get to these blockages at very small vessels in the brain and, and get them open in a definitive way 85, 90% of the time with only about a one to 3% complication rate. Wow. We additionally have, um, we've learned a lot from the cardiologists in, in the sense of we have a, a new generation of devices called stent trievers, which essentially look very much like a stent, like kind of like the binding of a spiral notebook that's, that props the artery open. There's a real downside to that though in the brain as opposed to the heart because you don't want to leave hardware behind. And so they're essentially like stents that have a little 
attachment on them. So you deploy that stent retriever, and when you actually pull that back into your smaller catheter, you're bringing the clot with it. Right. And, and those devices, unlike some of the early generation devices we've had, we now have class 1B or very good uh, evidence that shows that we get those arteries open in a definitive way the majority of the time. The challenge for our field now... I have to... I have to stop. Yeah, please. I haven't heard you say that you, you burrow away the skull, open up the brain. Yeah. And this is all this is all with minimally catheter, invasive. Right. This is all with catheters through an artery of the leg when we're talking about the primary treatment of a stroke. That means opening a blocked artery in the brain. Um, there are times where a, a lot of the goals of neurosurgery more broadly is there's a, a primary population of cells, of neurons that have died. And then everything we do is to prevent secondary cell death. And that can be from high blood pressure, high pressure in the head, from a lack of blood flow, or, 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 or from a, a, a problem with one of the blood vessels that we need to go in and fix. In those situations, open surgery is sometime required. But in this situation, this is something that's done entirely with catheters. Uh, again, amazing to me. Uh, yeah. When you're done, how long does a person stick around in the hospital? It, so a, a lot of that is a function of how successful we are in, in interrupting that process. So some of these folks end up still having a, a significant stroke based on how quickly they get to us. If we're able to completely reverse the stroke, they're in, they're in the hospital a couple days. But we're in a situation, yeah, so we've gone, from a, we've gone from a situation where people were going to be permanently disabled or, or ultimately pass away, and, and now they're, they're able to get back get back to their families and, and, and get really good rehab. So it, there's no question that it, it's an exceptionally rewarding field to be in now, and, and it's really exciting to see the, the progress we're making. Yeah, the, the change is really astonishing to me because I, I don't think that the, the person who has this happen recognizes that the same event X years ago, fill in the blank, whether it's 10, 15, 20, they, they don't walk out. Yeah. You know, and now, the, you know, they're, thanks, Doc, and they you know, see, yeah, see, yeah. see if my follow-up. Yeah. And, and they're walking out and no, still talking. No, you're exactly right. I, I, the best way to say it is I, I feel like I've really done my job if my patient never really knows how much was on the line in that, in that particular moment. I, I think what's as important, though, uh, for your audience is it doesn't really help us to interrupt that major stroke event if we don't figure out why that person had the stroke in the first place. And so one of the real advantages of uh, it being at a center that actually has the full complement of tools available is it doesn't help me if I prevent you from having this major stroke and then two weeks later you're in, this, you're in the same situation. Well, so, you've got cardiologists, neurologists, intensivists, you've got this whole team of people yeah. that <laughs> yeah. you know, come down. And, and, and the processes of care are, 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 are so important. And, and that's where going into treating that 25% that of patients who actually have a blockage of, for example, their carotid artery, we have two great ways to treat that. One, the gold standard is an, is an open operation where we go in and take that plaque out. And, and I think that uh, not many people have to see one of those plaques before they decide they want to you know, take care of themselves a little bit better. I think, I think it really shocked people to see what's living inside their blood vessels. And the other option is, is uh, is using a stent like the binding of a spiral uh, notebook to basically open that artery for them. And, and deciding if someone needs an end arterectomy or a stent is, is really the benefit of being in a place that, that can offer both in a comprehensive way. Those are all the blocked ones. What about the hemorrhagic ones? Yeah. So the most important thing uh, it, when you're dealing with a bleed within the brain is recognizing if there's an, an underlying problem with the blood vessels that cause that bleed to happen. If that's the case, then, then that's something that needs to be secured. And so the most common cause outside of high blood pressure causing a spontaneous hemorrhage in the bleed in an older person is, is if you actually have an aneurysm or a weakening of one of the arteries of the brain. And there was a time that many of these aneurysms, it was very, very difficult for us to treat. And now we actually have two great ways to treat those things. One, a whole uh, generation of catheter-based devices that we use to basically fill that aneurysm with coils and block it from the circulation. Amazing. And there are other times where, where open surgery is, is, is the best option. And you can go in and put a clip on that aneurysm and, and exclude it from the circulation. You don't put a new tube in uh, to flow through? There, there are situa very rare situations where we use stents within the brain to either hold the coils in the aneurysm and protect that artery, or a, a, a generation of flow diverting devices like the pipeline device, which you, we put in as a, as a freestanding device to treat certain complex aneurysms. But that, that's really less than 5% of, of aneurysm patients. But like a good carpenter, you have to have those tools available to you for that one in 20 that walks in. No, no question. Yeah. 
yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right, that aneurysms vary dramatically based on their size, their location in the brain, their morphology, or their shape. And so all of those technical factors go into deciding what's the best way to treat this problem. So a patient coming in to talk about this might get a diagnostic test called an angiogram. Right. Can you explain that just for a moment? Sure, so that's that's using catheters to go in and, and you put a catheter in the arteries of the neck, they don't go above the level of the neck and you inject dye and get very nice pictures of, of the aneurysm or that, of that weakening. And, and that angiogram can then inform your doctor about what's the best way to attack this and treat this and, and if the aneurysm potentially needs to be treated at all. I think what's so important is that often there, there's a real emphasis on, on using the catheters because people are very attracted to the idea of using minimal invasive techniques, but in the same way that these catheter treatments have changed, open surgery has, always, has also changed dramatically. And so there was a time where in order to get an aneurysm at, at the base of the brain, we used to have to do these very big craniotomies, and your approach was kind of like a trapezoid, a big opening, and you got narrow, Sweet. narrow field of view to get where you need to go. And, and with new microscopes and, and new instruments, we're now able to invert that trapezoid. And so aneurysms very deep in the brain, like at the anterior communicating artery, we can now get at through a small craniotomy through the eyebrow. And so, so in the same way that our catheter-based treatments have changed, our, our open surgical techniques have also changed. It sounds like most of medicine, and it's not run to one, run away from another, it's deploy the right approach yeah. for the right problem. Right. As a neurosurgeon, that's how I, I approached my training, and, and I felt like it was important to be trained in both, so I wouldn't be wed to one treatment modality or, or another as, as, as far as patients are concerned. That I can... in, in the short time that we have yeah, left, I, I just wanted to give you a chance to sort of do the world according to Kalesi and say, if you had your way, what would you see happening right now and going forward in the future, what do you expect to happen and what do you want to have happen? Yeah, I think what I would say is, is the most important thing when we're talking about an acute stroke is, is that the, the health system would be set up in, in a way that we described and worked through earlier, that if someone's having a severe acute neurologic deficit, that that, that ambulance would take them to a comprehensive stroke center where they would have the benefit of, of the full range of services uh, available. As important after that initial stroke event is that, that patients seek out care at places that can figure out why that took place and, and really uh, do a good job of of seeking care to prevent that from, from happening again. I, I think what your viewers should also take away is this is a ex very exciting time uh, in, in technology and the development of new devices, and we need to set up our research infrastructure in a way that, that we can get that technology out to patients in, in an organized and safe way. And, and one of the exciting things of being at UCSD with our Center for Future Surgery is a lot of the national courses around the training on those devices is, is, is taking place right here. One of the coolest places I've ever seen is yeah, Center for Future no, Surgery. No question. It, well, it's, it's been a real resource. Thank you so much for joining us uh, to educate people out there, and thank you for all the work you do outside of the TV studio oh, in your real life. Uh, we really appreciate you spending some time no. with us. Thank you very much for having me. I've been talking with Dr. Alexander Kalesi about uh, such an important topic, stroke. This is a big deal, and I hope you took away the message that you heard. If there's a problem, get help. If you notice any of those warning signs, do something about it. If one of your loved ones has this happening, don't take no for an answer. It's better to go to the emergency room and find out it was nothing than to find out you should have gone and you could have done something, but you didn't. I'm Dr. David Granite. Remember, knowledge is power. We'll see you again next time right here on Health Matters.